Hi, everyone. Welcome to Conversations with Nicole. Today, my guest is Gary Simrel of Rock Hill, South Carolina. Gary recently retired from the South Carolina House of Representatives after serving District 46 for 30 years. He is now at his alma mater, Winthrop University, serving his hometown in a new way as special assistant to the president for community engagement. Gary, welcome to my show. Oh, thank you for having me, Nicole. It's an honor. I'm delighted. So three decades as a lawmaker in South Carolina, serving your hometown of Rock Hill, South Carolina. Gosh, taking a look back, what what did all of that mean to you? And talk about your service. Well, it's it's interesting because, I, you know, as, as you think about things you want to do in life, it was actually an eighth grade trip to Columbia with my social studies class. I think they call it civics class today, but it was social studies then. And so we visited the state house. That was my first time at the state house. We visited both the house and the Senate and the governor's mansion, for that matter. Uh, I, I was I was in awe of the process. Uh, I liked politics. Uh, but visiting that day, uh, looking at both the House and the Senate, the difference between the two, I said to myself very quietly, uh, I would I would love to serve here one day. And that was a 13 year old me. Little did I know that just over 10 years later, the opportunity would arise where we had an open seat uh, because then Representative Wes Hayes, went to the Senate because our Senator John Hayes, no relation to Wes Hayes, yeah. uh, had become a judge. And so it opened up that Senate seat, which left the House seat open. I was one of three people to run. I was a Republican. Two Democrats ran. And they told me, they said, look, you're, you're too young. You have no money and you're a Republican. There's no way for you to win this seat. Turns out they were correct. Uh, I did not win, uh, but I did not give up hope. And so the, the next year, 1992, I ran again. And it's interesting because when you run for office, you 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 put your reputation on the line. Yeah. And so, you know, at, at that point, I then became a loser, whereas before I was just a candidate. First runner up is first loser, of course. And so um, I realized I was going to gamble it again and run if I lost now, I was already a loser. What what difference in having an extra merit badge, right? And so that's what I did, and, and I won. And so I looked back, and I was thinking, A, I never thought I would, would win, uh, hoped but didn't think so, and then it happened. And then if someone had said, you will serve 30 years, right. and you will leave on your own accord, uh, I would not, I would have bet against myself. And so it just shows you in life, it, it's difficult to predict a lot of times as to what happens. Right. But th to be able to serve the community that I love, I knew when I was graduating from high school, many of my friends could not wait to leave Rock Hill, this sure. sleepy little town, go off to college, go off to bigger and better things. And I thought I was the odd duck because not only did I want to stay in Rock Hill, but I wanted to go to Winthrop University right in my hometown. And so, you know, I was, I guess, home-based uh, as it were. I started out in 1984 at Winthrop college then, uh, but then ended up getting, I had a part-time job to pay my way through school, ended up getting a full-time job. So I went from a traditional student to a non-traditional student within the time that I was here, because then I had to work around my mm -hmm. schedule of working hours right. to see how compatible that would be with my college hours. So it took me seven years to get out. We often laugh <laughs> about the seven years that I was partying, not that I didn't have a good time, sure. but certainly I, I had a, a full-time job uh, at, at the ready as well. And so I worked my way through college. And, and interestingly enough, I graduated in May of 1991, announced that I was running for office that fall of 1991. So wow. it happened quickly uh, from that regard. But serving in, in Columbia, the interesting thing uh, about that is meeting the people that you meet that you would have never had the opportunity. So I know someone from every nook and cranny of South Carolina, no matter what town I'm in. Uh, right. My daughter one time had car trouble in Ainer, South Carolina. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, she called me. Well, I, I had a great friend in Ainer who was at her side within three minutes quicker than 911 would have responded. Right. And I was thinking, you know, that there's something to be said for that 
familiarity in the context of who we are as, as a people and as a state. Uh, and, and so I look back at, on my career, and certainly there are highlights and, and there are low parts to it, but knowing people, having that relationship with people, uh, you and I share a very close friend as well. And that's, you know, I, I would not have met him, Jim McGee, were it not for me serving in the, in the General Assembly. So those things become important. Uh, as a legacy and as a lifetime, because a career in politics, no matter how long it is, it has a beginning and it has an end. We're, we're stewards sure. for just, just a small time. The institution is what's important. The individual never should be more important than the institution. And I think, you know, that's what uh, I reflect upon in my service, you know, to South Carolina and what happened there. But that, that's been a great, a great ride for me. It's, it's been a privilege of a lifetime. I met my wife while I was going door to door campaigning. So I knocked on Mary Ruth's door <laughs> uh, and ended up meeting her. And so I had won the election regardless of the outcome right. of the November uh, ballot process. And so I look back even on that and, and think, you know, what a what a what an honor that I had to be out in the in the community and then look what came from that very campaign. So much came from that. In fact, it's interesting that you didn't win the first time. The second time you became the first Republican to win that office. What do you think it was that made you say, okay, I still want to try to do this. I feel called to serve. Talk about that. Well, I, I did feel I, I don't wear my religion on my sleeve, uh, but but I felt a, a yearning and a calling to do it. And then I was disappointed the first time I ran that I lost, although, you know, deep down, I had already prepared myself for the loss okay. uh, just based on what people were telling me. I believe what they were telling me. It turns out what they were telling me was correct. <laughs> well, they're it not wasn't always bad wrong, advice. At least it you was were just prepared. advice. But, yeah. but the second time I thought, you know, I, I, I hate to give up after one time. Hmm. And, and I had another piece of advice. Somebody said, well, if you lose twice in South Carolina, you're toast. Because I always looked at Abraham Lincoln. I mean, how many times did he lose before he finally became president? And it was numerous. And I thought, gosh, the South Carolina rule is a little different. But I thought, you know, I'll try it twice. If I lose the second time, obviously it wasn't meant to be, and, and I'll move on. Fortunately, it was meant to be. And, and what's interesting in my political career, after 30 years, I felt the same yearning and calling to leave as I had to enter. And so people say, why are you leaving? You know, and, and it, it, I felt a calling to leave. It was time. It was time as John Kennedy, you know, said, pass the torch uh, to a new generation. And it was, it was time. And so I, I'm honored uh, that the people of Rock Hill elected me 15 different times um, in my public career. So we, we grew up together as it, as it were. I was 25 years old, you know, and retired at 55 years old. So a 30 year career. And then Nicole, to think about more than half of my entire life, not my adult life, but my entire life was spent as an elected official. Wow. That, that's really something to be said about that, Gary. I mean, and you've had so many accomplishments during your time in office. What were the most meaningful for you? Well, I, I think the meaningful ends up being in the process as much as it is in, in, the, in what you accomplished. But I always say that you has to be very careful because what I realized when I was first elected, now, now let, let's go back 30 years. I ran as a Republican. People said you can't win as a Republican. I ran again. And so I went into office as a partisan. You know, Republicans were good. Democrats were bad. Democrats said they were good. And it was the Republicans were bad. Not much has changed in that 30 years right. from the retail standpoint of the parties not getting along. But when I got to Columbia, there were 80 plus Democrats, 40 plus Republicans. And so we were in the minority. And I learned very quickly that if you want to accomplish something, if you want to be effective for your community, which I did, yes. Wes Hayes was there prior to me and he was effective for our community. I wanted to carry on that tradition. I had to work with others. And so what, what worked for me was connecting, having respect for my colleagues from all over South Carolina. And so I built relationships that then built trust 
the trust then allowed me to become effective for my community. So, and technically it wasn't me, it was us that we worked together, you know, for the greater good of South Carolina, keeping that as kind of the, the, the mantra and the motto of who we are as South Carolinians. And so as, as I progressed, I never wanted to be in a leadership position. I wanted my focus to be Rock Hill centric. What's interesting is that then people started coming to me about a leadership position. And I said, gosh, I don't know that I have time. And <laughs> then I became a sub chair in 2010. So, you know, I've been serving a while. And, and so it, it what I realized at the time that it allowed me to be even more effective for my community. And then in 2014, we had a change in speakers. And so the, the speaker, the incoming speaker, Jay Lucas from Hartsville, South Carolina, asked me to chair um, a group, an ad hoc group to look at road funding in South Carolina. And so we, we had hours and hours of testimony. And so we realized that through this process, obviously, people complained about roads, oh, but yeah. that we had to have a plan. And so we knew there was a reform component, but there needed to be a revenue component. And we worked through that. It took three years from 2014 mm -hmm. to 2017 to get a pathway forward for sustainability and a way to make sure that our roads could keep up with the growth that we have right. in South Carolina. Now, 5.2 million people. When I got elected, about three and a half million people lived in South Carolina. So look at that change over right. 30 years as well. So that that process was important. The other thing that stands out to me was higher education, which of course I'm now working for my, my alma mater back in Rock Hill. But the fact is that from the early 2000s, we had a governor who came in by the name of Mark Sanford. And Mark Sanford did not want to borrow any money or spend any money. And so he had a difficult time with the General Assembly. Uh, it, was a, it was a very rough relationship, but he had the veto pen, of course, and, and so he had the bully pulpit as well. But colleges started suffering uh, after his election to governor. And so it became more expensive. And when it comes more expensive, obviously that's an impediment for families and students who want to go to a four-year institution, or even that matter for a two-year institution sure. like York Technical College that we have here. 2008 comes along when the Great Recession hits South Carolina as well as the rest of the nation. And so higher ed really took it on the chin then. And so things that were needed, whether it was technology improvements, building improvements, new buildings that, that were needs based on South Carolina campuses, they had to start borrowing money on their own to pay for these, which meant tuition again increased. So we, we were adding kind of insult to injury as it came to that. 2010 comes along. Governor Haley gets elected. She really carries out the same mind process and thought that Governor Sanford had as it relates back to higher education. So one of the things that we had done in South Carolina historically is every odd year, we would have a, a bond bill that would help pay for the needs on campuses around South Carolina. And it worked well. It was a small bond bill. There was nothing huge about it, but it kind of kept everybody in check. It kept tuition in check. It allowed for the needs of the campuses to be heard and seen and felt. And when that didn't happen for an atrophy period, really of 17 years, interestingly enough, I was put in charge of budgeting for higher education. So I knew two things. Number one, we need to start funding higher education from the state's perspective. These are state supported institutions right. of higher learning. We also had a difficult time because tuition was now increasing and the number of South Carolinians who were now degree seeking was dropping. It was not rising. And so we wanted to reach 60%. We were hovering in the 40s. And so we needed to bridge that gap. And so two things happened. Number one, for building needs on campuses for the for the physical plant, if you sure. will, uh, we took 100% of the capital reserve fund and applied it to colleges and universities in South Carolina. The other thing we did was mitigate tuition 
by front loading the recurring dollars through our budget. Of course, I work with people. I'm a consensus builder, work with the governor, work with the Senate to build to a crescendo of this process. And it worked. And so we've done that now for four years in South Carolina, and it has made made a huge impact right. with campuses. And so here, here's an interesting and and really has some irony to it. So one of the worst things in the country today is inflation. If you start looking at college tuition in South Carolina, go back to 2019 and carry that to 2022. So it's the 2022-23 year. Those four years, those four calendar years, there has been next to zero inflation if you are a degree-seeking student at a state-supported institution in South Carolina. I don't see that a lot on the news, but that is a fact. And so the fact is we have we have kept inflation at bay for colleges and universities in South Carolina. Moreover, we put more dollars into scholarships, especially needs-based scholarships. So those students that are maybe first-gen students who right. want to go to college but heretofore could not, we are making more and more ability for them to, to pursue that goal of a four-year institution. And so collaboratively working together uh, with the executive branch, the Senate, and the House, that's how we make that happen. Well, Gary, you are considered one of the a great negotiator uh, in during your time um, in Columbia, and all of those things that you just talked about are the reasons why you were you were able to bring people together to get things done, like with higher education, like with infrastructure on the roads, and getting a gas tax, which was so controversial at the time. But I would think now everybody is seeing the payoff from that with our roads and the improvements. So, I mean, that's exciting to see the things that have happened during your time to some bad getting through it, but rising above and seeing the good now, you know, especially for a parent who's paid tuition, just like you've said, that's awesome. Thank you. You know? Well, and again, that that's collaborative. Somebody says, you know, the, 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 this, it, it strikes me odd when somebody says, and I, I, you read something in the paper, it says good negotiator, consensus builder. Really, though, that is much easier uh, when you respect other people, when you listen to others' opinions, when you work collaboratively to get the job done. And in reality, it does. But some that, people don't get that. We need we could we need more people like you, sh share, you know, <laughs> sharing that common sense concept, I think, sometimes because you accomplish so much more when you do that. Well, and when I became majority leader, all of a sudden, I'm now thrust back into a more partisan role. Sure. So I became majority leader in 2016. And so the, the dynamics change. But one of the things that I realized and that I would not tolerate was partisanship because we were South Carolinians first. I've always said I'm a big R Rock Hillian. I'm a small R Republican. Uh, and, I, and I mean that because, because community is more important than party. But with that, my minority leader, uh, my colleague, Todd Rutherford, I told him, I will never surprise you. I mean, we're not going to always agree, but I'll never surprise you. You'll never have a gotcha moment for me. And in six years of me serving, he never did. And so when I was leaving, uh, he actually spoke about me from the floor. Uh, and it was touching. It was touching because it showed the respect we had for each other, although we were in different parties, although we had different goals in many instances of how to improve South Carolina, the thing we both respected about each other is that we both love South Carolina. And so I think I think from that perspective, that is what it's all about. And unfortunately, I think while South Carolina still embodies that spirit of cooperativeness, Washington does not. That was so my next Washington question is about broken. changing in politics. What That's have you correct. seen? And it some of it's it's disturbing. Very disturbing because that's gridlock. And I've often said, you know, Washington is at best has atrophy, at worst has gridlock. But either of those does not create a pathway to move forward. So when we hear of issues going on around the country that are vitally important, if you look at the leadership oftentimes in Washington, they're either battling each other or they're so hung up on partisanship, they have a difficult 
path ahead of trying to forge a solution. And guess who suffers? We do. The American people. We do. Does that ever make you want to say, "Mm, maybe I need to take my uh, leadership to the next level, run for another office or, or it does not. It does <laughs> so, not. <laughs> you know, and, and, it, and it's interesting because people have asked me that question. I'm before, sure. And um, I never wanted to serve in the state Senate, no offense to them. Okay. Uh, I wanted to be in the house. That's where I wanted to be. So I never, even, even if given an opportunity to move sure. to the Senate, that was not part of the plan that I felt called to. I don't have a, a, Feeling, I mean, you say never say never, but I, I just, in, as I look down the road that I'm traveling, I don't see that happening. Uh, you know, again, to to have come from where I was within that 30 year time of service and the, the ability to build um, relationships and to be in leadership, to be able to get think more and more things done for your community and for the state, that was important. But again, it's like any book. There's a beginning and there's an end, and I reached the end of of my book, and so it was the end. Okay, within your book, just in recent times, you uh, were so instrumental in authoring the bill that allowed for the Carolina Panthers to, you know, come to Rock Hill with their training facility. The property starts developing. People are so excited, and then all of a sudden, uh, Mr. Tepper pulls the plug on this project and. I'm sure that was devastating when that happened for not only you because of the role that you played in it, but obviously for all those involved and, of course, the community that you love. Do you, do you mind speaking about that? Oh, oh, no, not at all. And and of course, I mean, that's disappointment. Uh, you know, not not every hand is a winner, uh, but certainly from South Carolina's perspective, uh, we did what was needed to Uh, happen to bring an NFL franchise. And again, while we were talking about the Panthers, the particular bill talked about pro sports. And so South Carolina on its books within statute, we didn't have the ability to offer the job tax credits, economic development credits for a pro sports team. Well, the Carolina Panthers is not the North Carolina Panthers. It's not the South Carolina Panthers. It's the Carolina Panthers. And Jerry Richardson, you know, when he began this process from Wofford area, uh, he wanted it to be two states and one team. And so the, the, the fact that Rock Hill was in contention to have the headquarters for the Carolina Panthers was a big deal for us. Sure. But, but you have to carry it forward and look at, you know, what transpired uh, for South Carolina. We did what we needed to do uh, to make this happen. If you look at the piece of property today um, that that we talked about for the Panthers, the 240 acres that are along I-77, that was going to be an intermodal facility is what it was slated to be. So think about the truck traffic, all that would come with that without infrastructure. In this particular case of what we dealt with with the Carolina Panthers and their coming to this area, uh, we started working with the state of South Carolina through DOT to build an interchange to this piece of property. Uh, The Panthers did a ton of work. A lot of the reason we're named Rock Hill is because we have rock in the ground and hills above them. And so they spent millions and millions of dollars readying this property uh, for use for them. Now that that's not going to happen, here's the good news. The infrastructure that is in place is all public infrastructure. That interchange is public infrastructure. So usually when an economic development project happens, what doesn't happen in the beginning is the infrastructure that is needed to take care of the, of the traffic. So if you look at Kingsley and Baxter as an example, exit right. 85 with Domtar and LPL and all of the growth there, the traffic became the nightmare. Right. In this case, at exit 81, the traffic is abated before the project ever comes. So we're we're on the right side of history. Here's the other dynamic about that, because I always hear this word, taxpayer dollars. Taxpayer dollars are sacrosanct. They should always be guarded as that. But dollars spent on the interchange 
in Rock Hill, South Carolina, this particular one, had no supplantation of funds, whether that be from the gasoline tax, from C funds, which is the local tax, or the pennies for progress tax, which is the, the penny you pay in general sales tax. $40 million of this came from the state of South Carolina, which was Department of Commerce revenue. $30 million came from the federal government, thanks to Senator Lindsey Graham in Washington. That was a Tiger grant. That was $70 million. The Panthers uh, have about $5 million in that interchange. And then locally, the city of Rock Hill <clears throat> has some money in that interchange. And that's, that's where the, the dollars come from. So it did not stop us from other infrastructure needs that were already on schedule, whether that's exit 82, exit 85, or exit 90, or exit 88, the, the old baseball exit, as we call it, Gold Hill Road, all of those are still in play and still happening. This was just a bonus for us. And the fact that the Panthers actually never hired people within uh, the network in South Carolina, you know, no job tax credits were given, no economic development tax credits were given. Obviously, the city of Rock Hill put dollars into infrastructure, uh, which they, under the settlement, that returns to them. Uh, the county of York, who had put dollars in for road improvements back on the Mount Gallant side of that, obviously, there is a plan in place now for the returning of, of that dollar. So if you look at this down the road, it's disappointing now? Absolutely. I mean, we don't have the cachet of having the Carolina Panthers here. But what we do have is 240 prime acres of land with over one mile of interstate that we have the ability to develop and bring in tax revenue, to bring in general sales dollars that is good for the community. It's a controlled growth at that point, and it has the infrastructure in place to take care of the new traffic that it brings. And again, I can't think of any economic development project in my 30 years of service that the infrastructure was ahead of the development, right. whether it be BMW, whether it be Volvo, yeah. whether it be Boeing, or whether it be GT Tire, whether it be Gallo. All of those have had issues that must be dealt with as it relates to infrastructure after the project comes in. And this in this time, again, we are ahead of ourselves. So we, we take the disappointment, we look at the positive with the infrastructure in place, and we you feel confident soon, hopefully, then later, you'll have something happening on that piece of property. Beautiful piece of property. There's no reason that it that it would not, but it's enhanced. It's enhanced sure. too by everything that, that that is around that piece of property that moves Rock Hill and South Carolina forward. Again, disappointment in today, but certainly not disappointment in tomorrow. And in reality, Nicole, it is the Panthers and David Tepper's loss, not Rock Hill's loss. I would agree. I would agree. Rock Hill, after living here two two plus years, uh, it's it's a it's a great area. I'm, of course, I'm I'm a Winthrop graduate as well. I, I, Go Eagles! That's right. So <laughs> I have an appreciation for the area, and I and I do I do feel it is their loss. And I, uh, but I am hopeful, just like you are, and thankful for uh, what's next for that piece of property. So what?